Namaste, everybody. Welcome back to Ripples in the Sand, the podcast brought to you by us folks at Drifting Sands Haibun. Here, we invite Haibun poets who have appeared in the journal to both read and discuss their poetry and also give us their thoughts on the craft. This is your host, Sangeeta Kalrikil. To our regular listeners, thank you so much for supporting us. Hope you have subscribed to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell. Please like, love, comment, share, and spread the word of Haikai poetry to your friends. For this, the 11th episode of Ripples in the Sand, we have in our studio an inimitable force of Haikai tradition in India. Kala Ramesh is the founder and editor of Triveni Haikai India. She is also the founder and managing editor of Haiku Katha Journal. Kala has organized many Haikai conferences in India. She has launched several unique collaborative uh, projects which meld haiku with dancers, musicians, and painters. So, folks, please welcome Kala Ramesh. So uh, today, folks, we have a treat of several exquisite poems from Kala. Uh, they combine several aspects of Indian culture, some of the best haikai writing in the world. So let's get right down to it. However, Kala, I, uh, I think you have something else to say before you start your uh, haibu. Uh, yes, I must say my heartfelt gratitude to Richard and to you, Sangeeta, and to... Come on. Drifting Sands for calling me for this podcast, which is, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to tell you frankly. No, honor is um, ours. Ah, uh, no, uh, maybe, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm thrilled about it. I'm thrilled about it. Now, to start off about uh, Haibun, I mean, I don't have to say much, but Haibun is storytelling. And when it is said in the Haikai prose, you know, when I came in 2005, everyone was, all the editors, I mean, I was so new there. And all the editors, when I tried Haibun, would talk about Haikai prose. And over the years, nobody talks about it. I always wonder, has it changed so much? Why is that mm. Haikai prose, the term is not used? Because the mm. minute you use that term, you are, you, it, it, it intrigues you. And you want to know, what is that Haikai prose? Because you only know about prose writing. So what is it? And then I came to realize it has all the subtleness, the brief, the qualities that Haiku has. You transfer it onto the prose. And that you don't go on like a Ramayana or like a prose, a unwieldy, doesn't go around the bush. It, you come yeah. to the point. Oh. And, and when that happens, uh, and it's not flowery, because haiku is not flowery. You don't use your brains to write a haiku. You don't use your brains that much or your knowledge of that language so much to write haibun. Then what happens? The simplicity shows. Mm. And I think simplicity is is karumi, like Basho said, where just before dying, he said karumi is something that he has realized that the most important in haiku, and I would say karumi is also most important in haibun. And in tanka, they're all coming from the same root, and we understand it. So I just got five points. I'm not going too much into detail, of course, starting off. I would say, make every sentence count. Have a core around which you want the story to revolve. I read this somewhere and I'm going to quote, I don't know the person, but he says, you don't want to do throat clearing, which is putting a lot of unnecessary information in there before you get to the meat. So make every sentence count. The second would be use active voice. Even now, I'm not saying it's easy. And I came to know much later about the active and the passive voices. An active voice, to tell you briefly and to make it simpler, is subject plus verb plus object. And passive voice is object plus verb plus subject. 
So let me give you a sentence with passive voice first. The book is being read by Mala. Active voice would be Mala reads the book. The second sentence. The play was rated by the Hindustan Times to be one of the top plays of last year's season. The correct passive active voice would be the Hindustan Times rated the play to be one of the best. You come directly and you're not going round, touching the nose from this side and that side. Okay. Active voice is more compelling. And it makes a person who's listening or reading sit up. They don't get lost in their thoughts. To keep up your viewers' attention is not easy. You know, like Kumar Gandharva, because I come from the music field, Kumar Gandharva, Pandit Kumar Gandharva, who went on to get the Padma Bhushan, he used to say that a person's, his listeners' um, attention span is only 40 seconds. Okay, so he said that he would sing the last line of his bandish, of, of his composition, which is so difficult because I worked on it for 19 years. It's so difficult. He said, I will sing it only once. So the whole audience will go, wow, wow, and they'll clap. And the man who is, or the woman or the listener who has missed it, he says, I have their attention for the next five minutes. They will not let go of my face or my music for the next five minutes. I have them pinned. Okay. So passive voice has that quality because it's direct. It is not going around the bush. So I think that is very important in hybrid writing. I would say the next one should be, of course, to eliminate jarg jargon and cliches and Filler words and filler words we know in haiku we don't do padding. We are very concise and brief, and that that needs to be there in haibun too. It's it's part of the art form that Japan Japan has given us. And the last I would say, I mean the fourth one I would say, vary your sentences, the length of your sentence. That also captures if everything is the same length. Even the person who's reading it or the person who's reciting it gets into a mon monotone, mon monotonous tone. But if you vary your, your lens, which many hybrid people do it very effectively, the short ones, the longer ones, then the long ones, and then the short one immediately, it catches your uh, attention. And that, I think, is a trick worth following. And the last one, of course, is in Basho's voice, find your own voice. He says, don't imitate me. It's as boring as the two halves of a melon. Don't imitate me. It's as boring as the two halves of a melon. So find your own voice. Yes. Yes. Over to you, Sangeeta. No, thank you. Thank you. See, this is a great lesson not just i have to say not just in haikai writing but also in writing as a whole this is fantastic advice so uh, thank you so much kala and with this in mind let's go uh, and listen to kala's uh, haibun in her own voice uh, so kala the first haibun that you're going to read for us today is every house has a doorstep which was published in July uh, 2022 in Drifting Sands. Is there something you'd like us, uh, like our listeners to know before they hear the poem, especially about the title? Uh, yes, Sangeeta, I would. Because the <laughs> title is actually a Tamil proverb. It's Vitaka uh, Veda Vasapadi, which means every house has a doorstep. And my mother will, every time we go with some problem, she keep quoting. There are a few uh, proverbs which my father used to have and which she has. They, it's just dinned into our brain psychologically. It's there. And so when I wrote this haibun, and I've been going deep into uh, Vipassana with this type of meditation, and I've been reading about Buddha mainly thanks to my brother. 
and of course indian upanishads and uh, gita also but the story is that one young boy lost his father at the age of 14 he goes crying to buddha and he says save my father please save my father and if you can't do it who can do it buddha just couldn't pacify the crying child he said okay tomorrow get me two pots and i'll see what i can do the boy goes home excited he brings two pots the next day he's so excited he thinks his father is going to come back and he goes and gives it to his uh, to buddha buddha says come with me to the river and he says fill one pot with pebbles here's a cloth tie the cloth and nicely tie a knot with a thread and the other one keep it empty and here's the cloth tied with a thread now you have two pots i'll also come with you dip it in the river first dip the pot which is heavy and say float float please float pot but the pot will dance around and sink and sink and sink and go to the bottom of the river you put the next pot it has no pebbles in it it is just an empty pot you say pot please go down please go down whatever you say the pot is going to be on top floating so he says if your father has done good deeds any amount i mean we don't have to do anything if he's done bad deeds how much even i tell him he is going to sink but if he's done good deeds i don't have to be present at all he's going to go up to the heavens or wherever they die where they go wherever they die when they die so the boy falls at buddha's feet and he says please take me as a student so that's what the story is and that's what this hybun is about it says that every house has a doorstep every house has its problems every house has its death every house has its birth we all have problems and this is what this hybun is about shall i read it yes please wow shall i read yes, it please. yes please yeah. let's start with every the every house has a doorstep every house has a doorstep sunlight through bodhi trees the checkered path sunlight through bodhi trees the checkered path an elderly woman is lying on the veranda on a cot made of cotton ropes the news that the chief of the village is no more reaches her in no time her eldest daughter neha who has mastered the craft of being a mourner comes to her my wouldn't it be good if you are called to mourn rana pratap pratap ji's death how much should we charge the family we've not had any business for some months now we'll make it special charge more our storerooms are empty no wheat rice bajra or millet mai's eyes glisten with sadness she breaks into a reverie the passion that held her together all these years is palpable oh your husband is dead we would cry holding the widow's hands tossing our heads and wailing to the heavens beating our chest and slapping the ground in front of us our act was practiced a thousand times till we got it perfect for 12 days this performance would go on the longer the mourning period the more it would speak of the family's wealth the more theatrical the act the more it would spread from person to person in and around the village my continues families now want quite a funerals the need for induced weeping to release those pent up emotions is lost times have changed beti 
Rudalis are relegated to the background, robbed of any significant role. We are widows, living in poverty and disesteem. Morning mist, words of a song come, go. Morning mist, words of a song come, go. Beautiful. Thank you so much. This was this was such a beautiful rendition of the high one, which when I first read, oh, thank it you. struck me so hard. And now when I hear it, it's even, even deeper. So there is a cultural reference here, which perhaps our listeners should hear about. The idea of a mourner or a rudali. So the idea of someone absorbing another person's sorrow and expressing it. Uh, would you like to say a few words about uh, that to our listeners? In your yes, mind, what yes, does it Pandita. stand for? What does it stand for? It stands for the language <laughs> of tears. Yes. Oh, yes. that is so deep, the language of tears. We yes. cry when we are joy, in joy. We cry when we are sad. We cry when we are disappointed. We cry at the birth of a child. We cry at yes. the birth of a person dying. I mean, tears are multilingual, multilanguage. Okay, yes. so I said, this is the language of tears. Rudalis are professional mourners. The film Rudali... I don't know whether you saw it. Yes, the yes, film yes, Rudali inspired this high bone. Long back it came. Okay, oh, I see. Rudali was based. Yeah, Rudali was based on a 1979 short story of the same name by Bengali author Maheshweta Devi. Set in a small village in Rajasthan, the film star Dimple Kapadia played the role of a lonely and hardened woman who despite a lifetime of misfortune and abandonment, is unable to express grief through tears hmm. and is challenged with a new job as a professional mourner. And that made such a deep impression. It etched that, I mean, the whole movie and she's acted brilliantly. And I said, yes, why did. not write about it? So this album is not based on the film, but it's based on my own maybe imagination and fiction. Yes. But I wanted to also narrate what Rudali is uh, for all people who are not yes. aware. Because yes. in South India, we don't have that custom that much yes. as it is there in the North. So yeah, it's, South it's Indians, in we don't know so much. Yes, yes. So amidst the never-ending class struggle and the ever-changing socio-economic structure of the feudal system. This high bone highlights the plight of women in the system of exploitation and hunger. Mm. That's what yes. it is about. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, fantastic readers uh, and listeners. Uh, I hope you would be able to go and uh, read this one. It is in issue 16, July 2022 issue of uh, Drifting Sands Highborn. The way the last uh, haiku is written, it's, it's beautiful. It's a four line. Now for the second highborn, yes. which was published in the August 2023 issue of Contemporary Highborn Online. Uh, we enter uh, the beautiful woods at uh, IIT Chennai with Japanese aesthetics uh, experience Shinran uh, Yoku and combine it with an Indian philosophy. What would you like uh, our listeners to know uh, before they uh, hear the haibun about uh, Sanctum Sanctorum? Yes. See, Sanctum Sanctorum is... The term came for the Western Church. But I think we have an equivalent term called Garbha Griha. Garbha yes. means womb and Griha his house. So the Sanctum Sanctorum of a temple is yeah. the gate within and ultimately the, 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 the visitors or the devotees are made to stand outside and only few people, the priest, is allowed to go inside hmm. to touch the murti 
uh, or the idol to um, uh, to garland or whatever they have to do or to pray yeah. to tell the slokas or the, uh, uh, the the recitation okay so the garbha griha is a sanctum sanctorum the innermost sanctuary of hindu and jain temples which houses the murti the idol or the icon of the primary deity of the temple so uh, when i read the whole poem what is sanctum sanctorum something that is sacred something that is uh, so pure that when and that is the reason we remove our shoes when we go into the temple yeah yeah true in no other uh, religion uh, they go with their footwear but hindu religions we remove our footwear and one more correlated to that is every time a dancer or the percussionist the mridangas and tablas enter on the stage they touch the stage and keep it in their heart yeah. which is to say a silent permission from mother earth for trampling on her yeah. every dancer does it whether it is manipur dancing or kathak dancing or bharatanatyam or kathakali down from up north everywhere we touch the floor and touch it to our heart saying yeah. please forgive me okay yeah. so yeah. that is a sanctum sanctorum for an artist who climbs into the stage that is a moment of a uh, purity when she is going to perform and she is doing it on mother earth okay so here let me read sanctum sanctorum why did i always love to visit my aunt's place i was 6 years old then my uncle hardly talked to us he was a professor if that explains anything at all my aunt's place lay within the sprawling campus of the indian institute of technology which was part of a densely forested area in chennai i would open their back door and the deer spotted plain the ones with antlers later i came to know they were called reindeer were all there come and peaceful creatures nibbling the grass i was in thick woods but safe because of the wire fence guarding my aunt's backyard years later i visit a deer sanctuary and my past keeps flashing back a boat says shindrin yoko forest bathing I'm intrigued. I look around to see if anyone is there to tell me more about it. Nobody. I find a cozy nook and begin my search on Google. Shindrin Yoko is a bridge that connects us to the natural world or we could even say to the world within us. a falling leaf twirls the silence a falling leaf twirls the silence who am i a falling leaf twirls the silence who am i remembering guru ramana maharshi's line you may call a tree a standing man and man a walking tree you may call a tree a standing man and man a walking tree stillness in the breathing pine forest stillness in the breathing pine forest i remove my shoes stillness in the breathing pine forest i remove my shoes so if you see brilliant the last brilliant. line i remove my shoes yes goes back into the text into the prose and goes back to the title because the forest becomes a sanctum sanctorum yeah yeah 
and for a person who loves nature even for anybody if you get into the deep forest the forest is silent on the days it's silent there is a palpable a, a pregnant silence i would say it is there yeah. because trees are breathing we now know trees breathe <laughs> yes okay and there how can we walk with shoes yeah we it's a holy it ground because it's our, it's a holy ground and it's as as precious as a uh, pure as the temple that you want to go and see the murti or the the deity there and and that is the way it is if that is understood then you don't have to go to the temple at all because you find everything in the forest you find everything with nature mother mother earth is the god for you so, so the whole hybon ties up with the three parts Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Of course you I you might be asking that question again, but I have a different answer for that. But this is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I had a a very uh, tangential question not pertaining to the topic, but pertaining to high high bun writing if you don't mind. Uh what do you think in your words is the role of a title for a high bun? how important is it see the title is like the title of a book the cover it is important yes but of course that's what everyone says but the title of course should entice should grip the reader but it cannot give away too much yeah it cannot be from the prose the best when i came in 2005 it would be part of the haiku or the part of the prose and that would be the title mm. of course there are many poets who still do it um if they can do it effectively but if it is something that links and shifts away from the prose it links to the prose and the haiku and then adds a layer more so after the whole prose and the haiku you go back to sanctum sanctorum you mm. understand it yeah. more deeper and i think uh, i think the title um sometimes i agonize over a title sometimes the title comes in beautifully as i write but fine i mean that is a beauty of the challenge of being in this uh, art field so yes it's perfectly yes, writing beautifully yes yeah. yes yes um uh, so another question which is kind of related to uh, sanctum sanctorum would you like to elaborate on the ancient indian philosophy that you touch on uh and you weave together uh haikai and advaita this you are an advocate of well, advaitic philosophy yes yeah um uh, see when we got the computer when i got the computer my siblings got it much earlier when i got the computer in 2000 2000 uh january we were doing a lot of discussion on uh, advaita on uh, adi shankara's viveka chudamani my brother is very deep in all this mm. okay so, and my sister who's in america is very inquisitive she'll keep on needling him saying why is this why is this why is this so it was a beautiful <laughs> discussion we had and that was when he also introduced me to basho because living in the moment he said there's something called haiku kala and but it just went away i didn't even pay much attention till later much later in 2005 oh. when i came into haiku uh, now listen to this night songs gathering oneness night songs gathering oneness a wolf's howl brilliant it is night songs gathering oneness then gathering oneness becomes a pivot line gathering oneness a wolf's howl so the wolf's night song you get a lot of noises in the forest okay in the night the birds are singing sometimes they sing in the night you know many people said after dusk yeah. they don't they do at least in india they do okay they are gathering oneness what is gathering oneness the wolf's howl a wolf's howl is a loud howl it just gathers all the sounds and becomes one so yeah in hindu philosophy and more so in our cultural memory the concept known as advaita non duality oneness of consciousness is deeply entrenched yes 
that blade of grass, that mountain, you and I are all one pulsating consciousness. The grand Sanskrit pronouncement, Tattvamasi, you are that, appears in the Chandogya Upanishad, which was composed in the earlier part of the first millennium BCE. Indian thought has traveled far. We know for sure that Bodhidharma from Kanchipuram, South India, Buddha's disciple took dhyana. Dhyana means the dhyana yoga or the meditative absorption. He took it to China where it was known as Chan. The Chinese couldn't get the word dhyan. So they made it Chan, which when Japan took verbatim everything from China, right from their script, everything, the Chan became Zen. So Zen is nothing but a branch of the Upanishads. Now there are people who say everything is India, everything is India. I'm not one of those. But this has been proved again and again and again that Zen is nothing but the oneness of Advaita that was spoken in the Upanishads. Yeah. Okay. And then it was taken to this, this oneness from Advaita was taken to Buddhism, to Jainism. Then Sufi also took it. Mm -hmm. They talk always about the one oneness. They are the same. Everybody is the same in Sufi. And then you come to um, Zen where it's again about this. So when the Western world woke up to Zen and to Japanese culture, they were thinking, how is that? This is so beautiful. This oneness, this non-dual. But the non-duality is something that we've been having for the last so many years. All our uh, scriptures and all our uh, discourses, we're talking about this Advaitic principle of oneness. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, this is what it is. So, mm -hmm. it comes in, it creeps in, it, it just uh, enters forcefully into all my writings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful, uh, you know, introduction to our Advaitic philosophy. And uh, I'm sure it will interest a whole bunch of people who are going to listen to us. So, um, and uh, so uh, the next poem that we have is uh, Alpenglow which was published in Under the Bar Show yes. in 2022. Uh, would you like to mention the note first before you read the poem? Because there's a note which follows. Yes, I would. Yes, I would. This piece is an allusion to Meghadutta's, Megh, uh, The Cloud Messenger, which is a lyric poem written by Kalidasa, 4th and the 5th century EC who was considered to be one of the greatest Sanskrit poets. It describes how a yaksha or nature spirit who had been banished by his master to a remote region for a year asked a cloud to take a message of love to his wife. So this alpine glow is about asking uh, the cloud or the sun to take a message uh, to the across India. So it was inspired by this poem. Should I read the poem? Yes, please. Or do yes, you want please. me to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Alpin glow. My siblings and I have been named Dawnlit Mountains. We stand on the land of this remote region, rarely visited and unknown to many. I am located at the far eastern tip of this land that I call home, the first to be illuminated by the rising sun. This sprawling earth and rivers behind me require more time to shake off the shackles of darkness. At my dazzling best, I want to shout, hey, look at me, look at me. There isn't anyone around. Oh, sun god, Aditya, would you tell the people at Kanyakumari who gather in thousands to see you dip into the ocean 
that there are mountains up there also worth seeing? And don't forget to tell them that when they arrive, you will be there to greet them with a warm good morning. Gold-tipped wings of a Himalayan eagle. Gold-tipped wings of a Himalayan eagle, cloudless sky. Gold-tipped wings of a Himalayan eagle, cloudless sky. Beautiful. What beautiful pictures those bring to me. And, you know, it brings back memories of Kanyakumari for me, actually. It's beautiful. Thank you so much, Kala. Uh, I had a question about uh, getting back to some uh, techniques, right? Uh, about the horizontal and vertical yes. axis. Uh, you mentioned that you would be willing to give us a little bit of a uh, uh, look yes. into this. Yes, thank you, Sangeeta, thank you. for asking me. See, um, uh, in a talk, um, uh, Harua Shirani first spoke about the horizontal and the vertical axis and how it lends itself to highbound writing. Okay? I'm now going to talk about the horizontal and the vertical axis. Let me quote, because it's so much safer to quote Shirani instead of trying to or paraphrase it in my own words. In other words, there were two key axes, one horizontal, the present, the contemporary world, and the other, the vertical, leading back into the past to history and to other poems. So the horizontal is the present, contemporary world, and the other is the vertical axis, which goes back to the past, to history, and to other poems, people, note, you mention them, things like that. As I, was I, as I have shown in my book, Traces of Dreams, Landscape, Cultural Memory, and the Poetry of Basho, Basho believes that the poet had to work along both the axes. To work only in the present world, that means the horizontal axis, would result in poetry that was fleeting. To work just in the past, or on the other hand, would be to fall out of touch with the fundamental nature of Haikai, which was rooted in everyday world. Haikai was, by definition, anti-traditional, anti-classical, anti-establishment, but that did not mean that it rejected the past. Rather, it depended upon the past and on earlier texts and associations for its richness. And that is why I connected Alpen Glow to Kalidasa's Meghadut because it's very well known in India. So, Yes, like, just like the messenger, the cloud was a messenger. Here I'm asking the Aditya, the, the sun god, to be my messenger, to go there when people are waiting at Kanyakumari, who are waiting, you know, when we went, there were hundreds of people waiting for the, um, the yeah. And, and we went in August and the rain clouds completely hid it. So we never saw the sunset. <laughs> Oh, so I have to go there again once more. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that is the hack, horizontal yeah. and the vertical axis. When that yes. happens in a high boom, like it happens, uh, Shirani only spoke about haiku, but it's so much um, uh, important and so, um, uh, uh, what to say, it's a salient point in uh, high boom writing if you can yes. correlate it and it high bone, you have words to do it. If you can show the horizontal and the vertical axis in a haiku, which is just eight, nine words, you have around at least 250 words to play around. Yeah. And you should be able to do that. Bring both the axes into play. And that would make our poetry rich if all our Indians, mm -hmm. Indians are doing it. If we go back to our past and we bring that richness into our poems, that is going to make a, a 
like the the the, the French should do it, and the everyone maybe they are doing it. Okay, yeah. are, I'm not saying no one is doing it, but I'm just highlighting these points so that for people who have not been doing it, will sit up and say, "Hey, I must get the vertical axis inside." You know, I'm just been going around with the yeah. horizontal axis. Yeah. This so this this really helps us. Uh, this really helps us with our own high bone writing. Uh, just brings out a whole bunch of uh, you know you you can say a lot of lot more in lot less when you do the vertical axis i feel yeah yes yeah yes okay. yes okay. <laughs> thank you thank you for that mm. so um yeah let's let's proceed with some more reading uh so the next poem for this episode is the knot remains Uh, first published in presence in july 2017 and then later on in your book beyond the horizon beyond which is a fabulous book people if you don't if you haven't gotten it you got to have uh, you got to get your hands on it so the style of the oh, prose in this hybun is very different lots of dialogue usage uh, you got to hear this uh, so i'm i'm just i'm waiting so kala please yes thank you See, uh, when I was uh, say fifteen or sixteen, my father's cousin brother, he came over. His name was Doni. That was the first time I saw him. That was the last time I saw him. He's not come again. But it made such an impression. His character. I, I, I mean, so when I, I was not writing till uh, long. I mean, till recently. So when I started writing, I've got four high bone based on his his character. Okay, so that is what I've tried to bring it here. bring in so the story wow. the the uh, it is fiction uh, the 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 prose is fiction but it's based on the character based. of my uncle doni okay the knot remains where was i do not interrupt me young man i lose the thread oh that reminds me of a couplet by rahim do not cut the thread of love impulsively once broken it cannot be mended and even if mended the knot still remains what a beautiful thought ah yes coming back to my story i told my wife that we should buy a flat in one of those housing schemes for senior citizens had we moved in there i would have had friends by now people my age and we would all sit and discuss the present generation which is a gone generation for nothing at all they worry for everything they fuss if a child fails in nursery oh, oh, oh you tell me how can a child fail in nursery he beats his thigh boisterously Now hear this. I read it long back, somewhere. I forget where. Old age looks back. Youth looks forward. Middle age looks worried. Laugh, young man. Where is your sense of humor? The biggest fault of mine was that I listened to my wife too much. I should have put my foot down and booked that flat. for seniors now see my predicament my children don't want me look at the word daughter in law closely only by law she is my daughter law means force in force can there be love coming of frost an old scar starts to itch coming of frost an old scar starts to itch tell me what course to take what is your profession a lawyer you said very good oh you have to leave yes i know i've taken a lot of your time it was a pleasure discussing things with you I can tell you are a brilliant lawyer. You have my blessings for a bright future. 
I take his leave. I take his leave and head for the comfort of my home, two children and a dog. Leafless tree, leafless tree, the sun rises with a walking stick. Leafless tree, the sun rises with a walking stick. Yes. Thank you so much, Kala. This uh, uh, the sun rises with a walking stick. It's it's it it brings to mind such an image. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. Thank you so much, Kala. Uh, I wanted to reflect you know, it to the old to man who's point. who's without anyone. Yes, Just slowly, like. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I can I can see some clouds there where, through which the sun is rising. I mean, I can go any place. And that's the power of your haiku in this uh, in this haibun because that takes uh, the reader where they want to go. They, the reader also brings things yes. into the uh, poem. The beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so I would have loved to take a pause here. Um, but... I am dying to hear the next poem. Um, we would okay. love to <laughs> we would love for you to talk a bit more about the form of uh, Haibun or Thanka prose. Uh, uh, again, you know, we had we had uh, touched upon the title for a Haibun, right? Uh, now and also you talked about the prose in the beginning for a haibun, you know, when you were talking about uh, the haikai prose. What about the haiku? Because just like, you know, you're leaving us with this beautiful haiku at the end of the haibun. What about the haiku in a haibun? Uh, see, um, just when I came in 2005, I was very fortunate in rather six months or so for uh, um, uh, uh, Norman Darlington, who is an expert in Renko writing, to ask whether I would be interested in doing a Tripashwa with him. So one of the Indian joined me and Yajushi and he passed away some immediately after that. Renko is collaborative poetry and Susumu also said it once. We need to know, and I believe it very firmly, because uh, when I conduct the 60-hour um, course for symbiosis undergrads, I teach them haiku, but the next one, next month I teach them uh, renku. Because renku is collaborative poetry coming together, but it has a form, a very, very, uh, uh, what to say, a, 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 it's a tight form. So, it is jo ha Q. It is all divided into three parts. Jo is the introduction and ha is the intensive going into pensive, I mean uh, extensive. It goes into the story and jo ha Q is, Q is the rapid close. So you come to our music, you come to our music, alapi is very slow. Then yeah. you start the bandish and then the tablas picks up the speed, then the poet goes into the vistara or she goes into going deeper and into the rag complications. She has there uh, going up and down the twists and the twirls and then she plays with the composition, the words and the, with the laya, with the rhythm. And then what happens? We have a drut composition, which is a fast close. Yeah. Okay. So now come back to this haibun. When the Japanese gave this Joha Q in Renko, they have followed the same thing in Haibun also because the title is just opening the doors to you. It's like loosening the tie and sitting down. Mm. It is mm. not telling much, but it is there, very much there. Okay? And then you start the prose, which is storytelling. You build on your theme and you say it in a active voice so it catches the person's imagination the listener's imagination okay and that is the the second part joe is over the title ha is the the center part where you have foreign details foreign names 
anything that you want to put, the vertical axis, the horizontal axis. See, everything can get into that. It yields itself in the high bones. And then the fast close is the haiku. Haiku. Joha Q. Q is a rapid close. In our compositions, we have the druth composition. It makes everyone sit. Yes. It's so yes. beautiful. So the haiku is plays such an important role. The title plays, the prose plays, and the haiku. So when all three come together, in any piece of art, there should be unity. When, it, when things go as a tangent, it doesn't come together. Mm. And mm. here, there are three parts. And, and they've already shown it in uh, Renku, in Joe Hakyu. Every Renku, everyone must write a Renku. Then they'll know what is a seasonal word, what is a non-seasonal word. And the Joe Hakyu is the whole concept of this uh, framework. And if you understand that, see, everything seeps into the other. I always say when the foundation is broad, then we can build on what we later come to know. Yeah. And it all starts sitting well. And I think that is the beauty of uh, uh, what to say, uh, doing haiku and doing tanka and doing haibun and uh, doing one line and uh, and it, uh, it starts. Uh, Haika art. You start. Yes. Stepping into the stream, you start stepping into the stream. You need to step into the stream. You just can't be dipping your feet in the water and saying, "Oh, Haiko is beautiful." Step into yeah. the dream, uh, into the stream. Yeah. See the Haibun how it's written. See how Tanka prose is written. See how um, uh, two line Haiku, three line Haiku, how Tanka is written, and then it all comes together. Somewhere it comes together. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, talking about uh, Tanka prose, I had a question though, before we start the Tanka prose. How sacrosanct is prose in uh, Tanka prose or Haibun? What I mean is, um, is the form of the prose as a free verse poetry acceptable in Haibun? I mean, I know a lot of poets write it, but what do you think about that? Free verse poetry in a when Haibun? I came Yes, that's a beautiful question. Uh, when I came in 2005, I think 2007, see, I didn't have any classes and I didn't have any book on um, Haibun because they were all expensive for me. And uh, so it was just uh, submitting to uh, editors and they'll reject everything and then you see it, why have they rejected? Thought it was a great poem and you, you learn that way. Uh, now, uh, Facebook was not there in 2005. There was no uh, social media as such. I mean, or rather, I didn't know about it. Okay? Yeah. Okay. When I came, uh, what is the question you uh, spoke about? It's about How, the uh, previous, No, yeah. in 2008, yeah, 2008, when I was just searching through, Michael McClintock was one of my first editors. He was editing um, Simply Haiku as a Tanka editor. And uh, so I was a very nice person. So I went searching for his poems and I found that he had written a, a poem and with a haiku. In 2008, I found one of uh, his poems with haiku, um, uh, free verse with haiku. And I've not written free verse at all. So I attempted three or four of mine got it published long back. And now it's gaining importance. People from free verse are coming into highborn. Um, uh, maybe Michael McClintock was also writing free words. I don't know, but he had experimented. And maybe others during that time were writing. I'm not aware. But this particular poem, I know I saw Michael McClintock. And I've been searching and searching the net. I did, I'm not able to find it now. Mm -hmm. But okay. uh, that was when in 2008 it was written. And there's no reason why poets should not try it here. But one difference, you cannot have a pakka free verse in a haibun and then add a haiku. How good the haiku is. The free verse cannot look like a free verse because free verse has a has meter, has a rhyming words, it has repetitions. I don't know much about free verse, but I'm just telling you from what I've heard or what I've read. And those things don't sit well in haibun. You have to have the haibun prose, haikai prose, which I spoke about in the beginning. The haikai prose should be there, but in verse form with the haiku. And I think it should work. I mean, that is my contention. I can be completely wrong in my contention and my belief. But that is what I 
feel the iPad Pro should be there and it should not have the characteristics of a free verse. Maybe a blank verse and uh, yeah. maybe a prose, and then a haiku and it should work. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It should be a poems. prose poetry and not yeah. uh, prose poems and not a uh, free verse. Not a pakka free verse. I mean, I, I, pakka yeah, is a Hindi no, word. Not a regular free yeah. verse. Not a, um, uh, yeah. It cannot have repetitions. Cannot have rhyming words. It cannot have um, uh, the the meter and all that there. And then you stick a haiku. It the, the contrast is a bit too much. It doesn't gel. It doesn't come together. It is sticking mm -hmm. out at the at the corners so to bring yeah. that into a whole you have to have high kai pros it mm -hmm. has to be like yeah. a high kai it has to be like a high boom yeah that's what i feel mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay thank you yeah that 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 uh, helps a lot uh, that explains uh, very well thank you so uh, talking about Tanka prose, the next one is uh, your Tanka prose, as you call it, Tanka prose with a blatant twist. <laughs> uh, it was published uh -huh. in Contemporary Haibun Online in April 2023. Rebuttal. Kala, would you like to read it to us? Rebuttal. Rebuttal. The wheel of time rotates in its rhythm. The wheel of life rotates in its rhythm through the year, the moon on an ever-ending journey. The wheel of time rotates in its rhythm through the year, the moon on an ever-ending journey. Ever-ending? Excuse me, shouldn't it be never-ending? The moon is forever ending the journey, but has never been able to. For where is the end? In a circle? The moon is forever ending its journey, but has never been able to. For where is the end? In a circle? I row my boat to reach the other side. I row my boat to reach the other side only to find the other side is where I started. I row my boat to reach the other side only to find the other side is where I started. Yes. Thank you. This is this is so beautiful. This Tanka prose has such a philosophical dialogue going on. It's uh, it's uh, exquisite and it's it's so delicately said too and that i feel is your signature uh, in most of your work um, there is a philosophical bend to your poems always and uh, <clears throat> so before we go ahead uh, i had a basic question <clears throat> which i may ask many of our poets on the podcast uh, so i'm trying to i'm seeking a definition i'm trying to learn what in your mind is the difference between tanka prose and a haiku? Other than the fact that one has tanka and one has haiku in central. Um, let me see. Tanka prose and tanka and haibun. You have to understand how to write that prose whether it's tanka prose or whether it is haibun, that should be understood. And then you have to know how to write a tanka, you have to know how to write a haiku. It doesn't mean if you're a good haiku poet, you can write tanka prose well. Yeah. The tanka has to stand on its own. The haiku has to stand on its own. That is what partly what you said. Okay. Now listen to this quote by Nobu. I never get the Japanese terms, uh, names well. So Nobuyuki Yuasa says, In good haibun, the prose deepens the understanding of poetry. And the poetry gives greater energy to the prose. In good haibun, the prose deepens the understanding of the poetry. And the poetry gives greater energy to the prose. The relationship is like that between the moon and the earth. Mm -hmm. Each makes the other more beautiful. The relationship is like 
that between the moon and the earth, each makes the other more beautiful. Blith, Sprit, um, it came out in September 2000. Now, if that, if you go by this quotation, by this observation, then whether it is Haibun or whether it is Tanka prose, it is the same. Like what you said, it is just a shift from the Haiku, you put Haibun, I mean, in, you put a Tanka, then it becomes Tanka prose. But it is the moon viewing the earth and the earth moving, uh, seeing the uh, moon uh, from the earth or landing on the moon and seeing the earth. How beautiful it should look. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Having said that, you know, um, Claire Everett uh, interviewed uh, Jeffrey uh, uh, Woodwards long back, I think when he was an editor of uh, the Highbone today. And that article, I have the link with me. You can put the link there yes, if possible. Please. Okay. Yes, please. And that gives an extensive difference between Tanka Pros and Highbone. Mm. And I think if you, it's a huge article. It's a huge interview. If one reads it, you will come to know. You will come to know very well why it is different and how it's different. So I leave it to the masters to do that. I'll give you the link for this uh, thing. Yes. And I'm escaping from answering this question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is good. Thank you so much. So um, <coughs> we have the last poem from you. I mean, yes. after this, what a journey, what a journey. Well, we have the last poem from you, Vaulting Ambition. This was published in Contemporary Hibern Online in August 2023. Um is there something you would like to tell the readers before you uh, read it? Or? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, see, it is, it is a story that, okay, um, I didn't know about it that much. In South India, we don't know about it as much or rather I, I was ignorant of it till a dancer told me about it because I do a lot of collabor collaboration between uh, uh, haiku reading and uh, my reading haikai verses and uh, dancer and Vrishali Chitale told me about this and she danced it and uh, I put that into this haiku as a story. Oh, so this is what Let's it is. Let's hear it. Walting, hear it. Walting Ambition. I remember a story about the Kasturi Mruga, a mountain musk deer. One day, it sniffs a breath of musk perfume. Pursuing the source of the scent, it runs from jungle to jungle, through ravines and through hills. The poor animal becomes so obsessed that it can no longer eat, drink or sleep. Finally, starved and exhausted, it wanders about at random, only to slip from the top of a rock and fall. The musk deer's last act before death was to lick its belly, the torn belly, its musk pouch, torn from where it fell from the rock, pours out its perfume. The musk deer gasps and tries to breathe in the perfume, but it is too late. The perfume that the deer looked for externally was all the while within. This glass of green mango sherbet, fresh in my mind, the many roads I took to quench my thirst. This glass of green mango sherbet Fresh in my mind, the many roads I took to quench my thirst. So I do have something to tell. Thank it you. is about yes. how, yes, um, it is how about when we say we have to realize God, when we say we have to get, the Japanese called it Satori, in, in Indian philosophy we call it Mukti, and in English we say enlightened enlightenment mm -hmm. when a person in the spiritual path path wants to be attain satori 
we are searching. We are searching outside. Go back to Advaita. The oneness, the non-dualism. You are the God yourself. So where is the question of searching for the God outside? You are happiness yourself. Where is the question of searching for happiness outside? It's not going to happen. And that is what this poor deer did, the musk deer. It was searching for the perfume, which was so beautiful. And it searched, it searched so exhausted, it fell down, it slipped down the uh, cliff. And the musk and the pouch it had in its stomach tore. And the perfume came. It was so strong. But it was too late. Before he realized it was within himself, he was dead. And here, the, the tanka, this glass of green mango sherbet, fresh in my mind. The mango sherbet, especially the green mango sherbet, if you live in yes. Maharashtra, you are from Bombay, Panha. you know Pan. <laughs> pan. Yeah, Pan. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether I get the pronunciation correctly. Okay? And that, we all prepare. The raw mango, we all prepare. And we all drink it because it's supposed to be cooling because when the mangoes come back after a month, when the mangoes all become ripe and they're supposed to be heaty. And here you are preparing your uh, stomach and you're preparing your whole constitution to cool off so that you can enjoy all the mangoes uh, that uh, comes later. So this glass of green mango sherbet, fresh in my mind, the many roads I took to quench my thirst. Wow. We don't understand there's something within our own grasp, our clasp, and we're searching all over for some divine or some magic formula that will quench your thirst. And it is there within our reach. Every summer we have sumptuous amounts of mangoes and mangoes and mangoes, and that's going to quench your thirst if you can, if you know how to do it. So, so I've, I've been relating my stories to my poems and my poems give out the answer, sort of. Every way, if you notice, my stories give out the answer to what may be uh, uh, the questions that arise in the listeners, if they want to go deeper into the philosophical aspect. But again, I wouldn't agree with you when you say all my poems are uh, philosophical for the simple reason. I picked those poems and I offered to you and do you also agree to have those poems? I have Yes, poems but I also read your poems, right? I also read your yeah, poems yeah. outside and I know that there is, there is a philosophical bend to your thinking, which I can see. It comes through all your poems for me. Yes. So that way. So that this one is, uh, yeah. This this tanka prose is so. It, again, it is a circular one. You know, you you go all out. Circular. Looking, yeah, and then it yes. you're coming back to yourself. Yes, uh, and vaulting you know? ambition. I took it from Shakespeare. Uh -huh. In Macbeth, in Lady Mac, Lady oh, Macbeth yeah. says, "The vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls on the other." Yes, 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 yes. That's a quote. Yes. I've always loved that. Okay. So I took vaulting ambition from that because that's what we are all. We are all, our ambitions are vaulting. We want to know what's happiness. We want to know that. We want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I related that and that is the vertical axis. The vertical axis is a story, Indian story. It is also in case people want to know, it is Lady Macbeth who, you know, <laughs> a vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls on the other. Yeah. How beautiful that is. So that's what it is oh, all about. Fantastic. What a what an hour. What an hour it has been, Kala. It's it has been a pleasure and an honor, of course, to hear you uh, read out your poems and also discuss some background philosophy that went with it. Uh, and also learn your uh, ideas about the form itself, you know, the Haikai form. Uh, you have brought out this idea of the three, this thing in Triveni, your uh, or organization, as I would call it. Uh, uh, I am honored to be a part of that as yeah. well. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, what an experience yes, it is. You're uh, so active there. <laughs> I, I love it. The, the idea behind Triveni of workshopping and helping each other out and, uh, you know, helping write this. It is a very difficult form of poetry, I feel. 
high kai poetry a uh, lot of subtleties lot of subtleties in it so and i i have to say uh, triveni has helped a lot in that and so thank you for bringing that out to the world uh, as well but overall <laughs> yeah. i i wanted to thank you for this lovely reading and this lovely hour that we had Thank, thank you, you and thanks a lot Sangeeta for having me and your questions were lovely i thought about it and then uh, you knew how to incorporate uh, all that i said into your to your questions and that was brilliant <laughs> and um, and uh, thanks a lot for richard for asking me uh, whether i can do it and i said of course richard i will love to be i am honored to do this uh, podcast for um, drifting sands and i think you're doing wonders there Thank I think uh, Thank there's so much passion. Uh, I see so much passion. I mean, it everything works only when there's passion behind. It cannot this work otherwise. Yes. So, yes. This is yes. true. So, this is true. and thanks for those kind words about. Um, uh, I wouldn't call it just Triveni. I call it Triveni Hi Kai India, okay. because it is an organization for India and and uh, opening our doors to the whole world to join us. in our quest for nurturing and the tenderness with which we nurture each other so that we are there to grow stronger each month and each year and to be a better poet so i guess and you're so active sangeeta you're so there and we are very <laughs> no, happy to have you there triveni uh, and all the forums under triveni has helped me a lot and i'm i'm hoping that listeners would if they haven't already they should go and check out triveni haikai india the website and all the different forms and the discussions that we have of, of all a lot of haikai forms as well so uh, i hope they go and check it out i will leave a link to that as well in the show notes thank you so much yes, kala yes yeah. thank you thank you so much Thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you. Many thanks to Kala for spending her time with us. Her first book of haiku and haibun, Beyond the Horizon Beyond, uh, is available on Amazon. Her book of uh, tanka and tanka prose, The Forest I Know, was uh, published by Harper Collins and is also available on uh, Amazon. Her anthology. Nad Anunad brings together poets from over 20 countries. So folks all these books are available from Amazon. Uh have a look, check them out. Uh they are absolutely they have absolutely beautiful poetry, I know. Folks, before I leave, here is our founder and managing editor Richard Grant with a brief message. Thank you, Sandeena. Folks, Drinking Sands I Bond It's a 100% volunteer-driven, community-based project. Our primary goal here is to engage our readers and listeners' imagination with contemporary haibun and tanka prose poetry. Another goal is to provide a platform that welcomes writers of these genres. Through projects such as the Drifting Sands Journal and this podcast, we reach out to an audience that spans the globe. We're constantly seeking new and improved ways to realize these goals, including brainstorming, collaborating, and improvising. To learn how you can contribute to the success of this community endeavor, please visit the About Us menu on our website. The music in this episode is by Richard Grant. This podcast is brought produced by Richard Grant, and this is Sangeeta Kalarikil signing off. Thank you for listening.